So the story goes on Reddit that when Toyota released the first Lexus LS400 in 1989, Cadillac engineers from GM took the car apart. Their analysis concluded that such a car could not be built using their company's existing methods. I cannot confirm this story, which appears in a business strategy book without provenance, but nevertheless, the LS400 and its cohort changed automotive history. It was an incredible car at an amazing price. In this video, we look at how Toyota blew open the luxury car market with the legendary Lexus LS400. It is the 1980s and the American market was in a bit of a funny state. In the prior decade, a confluence of things staggered Detroit and propelled Japanese-made car imports to prominence. The oil crises of the 1970s and the new fuel standards that followed, the major quality gaps between Japanese and domestic American cars, so on. The U.S. government eventually intervened. In 1981, the Reagan administration negotiated the voluntary export restraint, capping the number of cars imported into the United States from Japan. As I covered in a previous video, the new voluntary export restraint incentivized Toyota, Honda, and Nissan to open factories in the United States, so that was in progress throughout this timeline. But the VER also incentivized them to make luxury import cars. These compete less on price than on distinctive features like performance, feel, or comfort, so they tend to have better profit margins and so are more suited for imports. The Japanese car makers also saw a potential danger. In 1981, BMW entered Japan's luxury car market. It started off slow, but by 1987, BMW was Japan's top-selling foreign car with over 15,000 units sold each year. It was a warning to the Japanese car companies that tastes can change, and they were, in fact, changing. If they did not go upscale, then someone else might do it first. The big issue, however, was that Toyotas, Hondas, and Nissans were still largely perceived in the American market as small economy cars, and the existing competition was substantial. In the mid-1980s, the American luxury car market was dominated by companies from two countries, the United States and Germany. 70% of luxury car sales were from the American companies, General Motors and Ford. From General Motors, you had the flagship luxury Cadillac division. The Cadillac brand dates back to 1902 and is known for its comfort and prestige. From Ford, there was the Lincoln luxury brand, which competed head-on with the Cadillac. General Motors' corporate strategy targeted various niches using brands, so below the Cadillac, General Motors had the Buick and Oldsmobile luxury car brands. These were entry-level luxury brands, a bit more understated. So that was 70% of the market. Most of the rest were German cars, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Audi, and Porsche. People who bought those cars appreciated how fun and enjoyable they were to drive. I'll get more into the differences later, but generally speaking, the American luxury cars focused on comfort and prestige, and the European cars focused on raw oomph and performance. Image matters so much here. As the president of Porsche America said, nobody needs a Mercedes-Benz. Nobody needs a Porsche. These decisions are made on very emotional factors. As seems to be so often the case, Honda took the first step. In 1983, they started a new division, originally codenamed Channel 2 and later renamed Acura. Its slogan was, Precision Crafted Automobiles. The design intent was to make sporty cars with the goal of satisfying the most demanding drivers. To sell the brand, Honda set up an entirely separate automotive dealer network. The first Acura cars arrived in 1986, the Legend and the Integra. With their flagship Legend car, Acura wanted to make a big luxurious car that competed with the Europeans. The base price was around $19,500, or $55,000 today. This was a few thousand dollars below the American and German luxury cars, targeting up-and-coming consumers who still yet can't afford those cars. The Integra, on the other hand, was upmarket but still affordable. Reviews called it an all-around good sporty hatchback that impressively managed to squeeze a lot of performance out of a smaller engine. Its base price was $10,500, which is about $30,300 today. In its first full year of sales in 1987, Acura sold 109,000 cars, more than Mercedes-Benz or BMW. About half of those were the flagship high-margin legend cars. 
Acura's success validated the strategy. The difficult 1970s were over. Americans were indeed getting richer, and they wanted to show it off. Nissan began working on their Infiniti luxury brand, and then there was Toyota. Toyota had actually once tried to break into the luxury car segment many years ago. In 1958, they brought their high-end Toyopet crown car to the United States, their first import. The car had sold well in Japan, and Toyota management felt confident that it could compete in the United States. They launched the car with great fanfare and high expectations. It looked like a Cadillac, and the first units were displayed and sold in glamorous Hollywood, California. The price was set at $1,999. With the average American family making about $5,100 annually back then, it was definitely a luxury. But the crown flopped in America. The car could not live up to its lofty price. Famously, it suffered severe engineering issues in America. The crown had been designed for Japan's then unpaved roads, but on American roads, the crown was very underpowered. Its top speed was about 60 miles an hour, and thus, it could not keep up with other cars on the highway. And if it did hit that speed, the car's body would shake so violently that you supposedly could not look out through the rear-view mirror. There were also cultural issues with the name. Toyopet worked fine in Japan, but it contained two words that people did not necessarily think of as luxurious. Toy and pet. In its first year, Toyota sold only 287 units. Sales improved the next year, but not enough. After less than two years and $1.4 million lost, Toyota withdrew the car. As a result of the debacle, the company later adjusted its product development and launch strategies. It was a hard lesson for the company in fully understanding and catering to local driving cultures. After adjustments, the Crown did eventually find success as a hard-working taxi and police car. Today, it is one of the oldest nameplates still on sale. Going into the 1980s, Toyota did not have a luxury car on sale. Toyota's most popular car was the $13,500 Camry. Their most expensive car was a $16,000 Cressida. Both of these are small, compact cars with a relatively low max speed. But in 1983, the same year that Honda began work on the Acura brand, AG Toyota held a secret meeting at Toyota's headquarters. AG Toyota was the cousin of Toyota Motor founder Kiichiro Toyota. He succeeded the company after Kiichiro's passing. AG had recently stepped down as president but remained chairman. In this secret meeting, he asked the company's top designers, engineers, and managers, can we create a four-door luxury car to challenge the very best? The team said yes, and they truly believed that. But just because they could doesn't mean they should. This effort would cost hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of man-hours of R&D. Shoichiro Toyota, Kiichiro's son and Eiji's successor as president, had wondered at the time if Toyota should stick to its bread and butter of making good, cheap cars. Would Americans buy a high-end machine from Toyota? But Eiji Toyota believed that the time had come. Toyota and other Japanese cars had come a long way. Their engineers craved a new challenge, something to push the limits. And thus started the top secret project F1. The F stood for flagship, and the 1 stood for number 1. The name has nothing to do with the Formula 1 brand. Uh, the project was also sometimes called Circle F because that was how they drew it in the room. The F1 would be Aiji Toyota's legacy. Over 20 years after the Toyopet Crown debacle, Toyota would try the luxury car space again. If it failed, then it would be a long, long time before they can try once more. For a typical new car project, Toyota assigns a team of 200 engineers at the most and budgets the project at about half a million. The F1 project would eventually involve 1,400 engineers, as well as 2,300 technicians, 200 support staff, and 60 designers and it would cost upwards of a billion dollars. But rumors hinted at numbers up to three times that. Toyota designed the F1 car from the ground up to cater to the taste of a specific type of American luxury car buyer. In 1985, Toyota sent a market research group to the United States to interview dealers and hold focus groups. The team determined that American luxury car buyers aged 60 years or more would stick to their Cadillacs and Lincolns. But there was a segment of customers less beholden to old brands. There were about 45 to 54 years old, 
with an annual household income of 100k, or about 270k today. They desired the performance of a European car, but at a lower price. To craft a high-performance design that appealed to this buyer, five designers moved to Laguna Beach, California to study American luxury lifestyles in person. They rented a house overlooking the Pacific, ate expensive food, watched Asianometry videos, and rented luxury cars. Sounds pretty nice. But they reasoned that to design something for that lifestyle, they needed to live it. As it turns out, Toyota management did not like the designs from that trip. They felt it was too quote-unquote American, too aggressive and sporty. So they made it a bit boxier and taller with a distinct front grille to make it look more like a quote classic luxury car, end quote. Performance-wise, Toyota wanted no compromises. European luxury cars were fast, but less fuel efficient. A BMW or Mercedes-Benz can hit 130 or 140 miles an hour, but can only do 20 miles per gallon or less. In the United States, any car that does under 22.5 miles per gallon would be subject to a gas guzzler car tax. American cars like Cadillac had better fuel efficiency, 23 miles per gallon or better, but those cars' maximum speeds were lower, maybe 115 to 120 miles an hour. As I mentioned earlier, they emphasized luxurious comfort and prestige. Toyota and its chief engineer Ichiro Suzuki, no relation to the Mariner's star, but I badly wish there was, wanted a car that was both. Fast, a top speed of 155 miles, which was higher than what the BMW 735i and Benz 420SE did, and fuel efficient, 25 miles per gallon on the highway. This not only avoided the up to $3,800 gas guzzler tax, but fit the no compromises part of their plan. Furthermore, high performance means more than just speed and efficiency. Toyota also wanted reliability, ease of service, low weight, low noise, smoothness, and flexibility. Key to this was the engine, the heaviest, most expensive, and thus most important part of the car. That was a ride. Early in the process, the team chose to use a compact 8-cylinder engine, called a V8. V8s are well-balanced engines and what all the other sports cars had. But what size V8 engine? Early iterations in 1985 had a 3.8-liter V8 engine. It allowed a top speed of 150 miles an hour and just barely skirted under the gas guzzler tax. It seemed satisfactory. Then suddenly, at the last second, Suzuki received news. Toyota's rival Nissan was also doing a luxury car brand, Infiniti, and it was rumored, correctly, as it later turned out, to have a big engine, 4 plus liters. So Ichiro flipped his bat and upscaled the F1 car engine to 4 liters. That gave you more power but also means a bigger, heavier engine that you must somehow stuff into the existing design. But Ichiro demanded it. To reduce the engine weight, the team cast the engine block, which contains the cylinders, in aluminium alloys. They did the same for key internal parts like the cam covers, cylinder heads, cam followers, and so on. Some of these components, like the cylinder heads, had never been done this way before. Entire factories had to be retooled with machine tools and custom-made equipment. Suzuki had to personally approve any weight gain over a third of an ounce. The final engine, named the 1UZFE, weighed 3,759 pounds, well under the 4,000 pound threshold needed to beat the gas guzzler tax. In the end, Toyota built 973 prototype engines for the F1 car. It is considered one of the best V8 engines of its time. During the manufacturing stage, Toyota produced 450 running prototypes and drove them over 2.7 million miles. A hundred of those car prototypes are crashed for safety tests. At Toyota's flagship car factory, Tahara, the company added 300 more inspections than what any previous Toyota had. The company designed a new laser-based welding system for it. Unique plates were bonded between the steel panels in order to cut down on sound. The interior was designed to strike a luxurious atmosphere between that of American, too plushy, and European cars, too hard. It took two years to decide on the right wood grains, tanning methods, and textures. They looked at interior car gadgets like a trip computer or TV, but vetoed them in the name of simplicity. Just the stereo and cellular phone. Even the stereo, Toyota said, they spent three years developing, working with the Japanese hi-fi company Nakamichi on a custom option. I can go on and on and I think there are some great stories. 
like how Suzuki would not give his final approval to the car unless he personally drove it from Los Angeles to Florida via Chicago. But the overarching point is that they put a lot of effort into this car. Let's move on. Toyota first unveiled their luxury ambitions at the 1987 Frankfurt show, targeting a 1989 release date. To market the car, their advertising agency Saatchi & Saatchi created a separate sub-team to handle the marketing. The Lexus brand was finally unveiled on January 2, 1988 at the Greater LA Auto Show. There were 1,500 applicants for a Lexus dealership. Only about 100 were chosen out of this initial lot. Toyota focused on applicants who really cared about the customer buying experience. Dealers had to invest up to $5 million in the showroom, including even a media wall to properly tell the Lexus story. Later that November, the car was finally unveiled to the press and given the LS400 name, LS standing for luxury sedan and 400 referring to its 4-liter V8 engine. Toyota backed this rollout with a massive war chest. In its first year of sales, Toyota spent $50 million to advertise their new line of cars. Adverts played on tropes of masculinity and up-and-coming success in the business field. Urban white-collar workers who were getting richer and previously had not thought about owning a luxury vehicle, as indicated by ad headlines like, Introducing a Lexus for those who've never seen themselves in a Lexus. So, it was a bit anxious for them when the Lexus name, chosen for its luxury connotations, got into a legal kerfuffle later in 1988. A company in Ohio, Mead Data Central, sued them for diluting the trademark for their legal research database product, Lexus. A judge put a temporary injunction on using the name. Toyota finally won that trademark suit in May 1989 after a few nail-biting months. Had they lost, the backups would have been Lucidia, Luxil, Luxel, and Lexia, which all sound pretty terrible. When Toyota first unveiled the LS400 in November 1988, Buick's general manager remarked, It's not a foregone conclusion Lexus will succeed. It's not as good as one. We've been outselling the Honda Acura so we aren't shaking in our boots. It's one more competitor. The general feeling in the industry had been similar. Then the car came out and was so different that people could not possibly see it as just another Toyota. Reviews liked its comfortable ride, agility, turn of speed, and quiet travel. The price got a lot of attention. Its launch base sticker price was $35,000, pushed up in part by a stronger Japanese yen. People and the press went nuts over this. Who would ever pay so much for a Japanese car? But the LS400 was priced $30,000 less than a Mercedes 420 SEL, $10,000 less than a Jaguar and BMW. Buyers flocked to what they saw as an amazing deal for the dollar. And in true luxury fashion, they paid for the best possible configuration. At launch, Toyota also had the Lexus ES250 alongside the LS. Despite being priced at a more reasonable $21,000, it did not sell well. Basically, the ES suffered the iPhone 5C effect. The customers simply wanted the better car and could afford it. They even bought the higher-end version with better interiors, straining Toyota's leather trim suppliers. Toyota sold over 4,000 LS400s in the first month of its debut. It seemed like an auspicious start, but just three months into the launch, disaster struck. Three types of defects were reported, including two cases involving the cruise control not turning off. Toyota decided to recall all 8,000 Lexus LS400s sold up until then. Toyota sent every LS400 owner a letter personally signed by Lexus division manager Dave Illingworth. Then, they picked up every car at the owner's home, leaving behind replacement car for them to use. After repairing the car, they returned it with a wash and a full tank of gas, all for free. The whole thing was done in 20 days. Dealers marveled at how efficiently the whole thing was run. The recall turned out to be one of those things that boosted the Lexus brand in the long run, though I'm pretty sure Toyota would have preferred it not happen in the first place. It did not dent sales momentum. In 1990, its first full year of sales, Lexus sold 63,000 cars, 3,000 more than its expectation. Unit sales soared to 95,000 units three years later in 1993. The incumbent luxury car makers now faced a set of Japanese competitors offering 90% of the performance or better for 60% of the price. 
combined with a relatively weak auto market in 1989, the effect was rough. In 1989, Mercedes sales declined by 18% despite offering sales incentives of $5,000 or more. Audi sales also dropped by 21%, and sales of Porsche cars, whose lower-end cars faced especially heavy competition, fell 48%. Sales would later rebound after 1991, as the European car vendors adjusted to this new competition on the market. For the Americans, Cadillac and Lincoln declined throughout the late 1980s and early 1990s, and the long-term shift into SUVs and trucks began during this period of time. By 2000, Lexus was the top-selling luxury nameplate in America, topping the J.D. Power & Associates surveys throughout the 1990s. Before we conclude, would you like to know more? I want to recommend two fascinating books that I leaned on for this video. First was Brian Long's Lexus, The Challenge to Create the Finest Automobile, and second Chester Dawson's Lexus, The Relentless Pursuit. They weren't the only things I read for this, but I enjoyed them nevertheless. Go buy these books today. Anyway, Lexus and the Nissan Infiniti brand, which launched just a few months later with a similarly massive ad blitz, surpassed consumer expectations of what Japanese cars were previously capable of. And it blazed the strategy for later car companies trying their own moves up into the luxury high end. In 2003, Hyundai followed the playbook for the launch of their high-end brand, Genesis. They even created a Michelin restaurant inside a car showcase for potential customers. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Chinese EV makers aren't studying it right now for their own future leap into the American high end. I'm going to end it here. Today, Lexus remains a top-tier luxury car brand, and its pioneering LS400, a legendary car well-liked by those who owned it. It's launched a massive leap forward for the Japanese car industry. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the Patreon, and I'll see you guys next time.